from Microbe TV. This is Beyond the Noise, episode number 82, recorded on October 6, 2025. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, Cutting to the Chase on Important Health Topics. Today, we're going to take a closer look at Paul's latest column, Jumping Without a Net. So the ACIP, the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices, you know, I never used to know what it stood for. And then now it's been on my tongue a lot. I don't know why, but now I know it. They want to consider delaying the vaccine for hepatitis B virus. So can you tell us a bit about hepatitis B and its consequences? Sure. So um, if a mother is infected with hepatitis B virus um, while pregnant, um, the chance that she will deliver a child that has hepatitis B is about 85%. And if a child gets infected with hepatitis B in the first 12 months of life, their chance of going on to develop cirrhosis or liver cancer is about 90%. So that was the birth of the birth dose, if you will. So it's really post-exposure prophylaxis, right? Because the virus isn't transmitted transplacentally to the child. It's transmitted to the child while passing through a bloody birth canal that contains hepatitis B virus. So that was the birth of the birth dose, which really was started um, in 1982. So the virus, the vaccine, sorry, was um, licensed in 1981. The birth dose was then recommended initially for all pregnant women in the, in the first trimester who were tested as being positive. And that didn't really make much difference. It didn't make much of a dent in the instance of hepatitis B infection in childhood. So then in 1988, six years later, they changed that to include not only women who were tested as being hepatitis B surface antigen positive in the first trimester, but also to any woman who was in high risk. So Southeast Asian immigrants, Alaska natives, that didn't make much of a dent. So then they extended again in 1991 to include all uh all uh, children who were born in at, at, at hopefully uh, they would get the dose before they left the hospital. That was 1991. And that didn't make much of a difference. <laughs> and the reason is, is they found out very soon is that in 1991, there were roughly 30,000 children less than 10 years of age who got hepatitis B in this country. Half of them got it from their mothers. The other half got it from relatively casual contact um, with from people who had chronic hepatitis B virus and didn't know it. How many people in the U.S. are infected with hepatitis B virus? Do we know? Yeah, so it's tens of thousands of every year. And then in terms of how many are chronically infected, about a little over 2 million. Now, when, when a baby acquires infection from either the mother or someone else, how long is it before the baby has symptoms of hepatitis? So usually the incubation period, the time from when you're first exposed to the virus when you develop symptoms is, is six to eight weeks. So it can be a while. Um, that's why um, post-exposure prophylaxis works. So same thing, rabies, which is another long incubation period. But if you wait, and, and in September, the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practice proposed uh, this year that they were considering delaying the birth dose till one month or two months. Incubation period, six to eight weeks. So now you're playing a dangerous game. If a child is exposed um, to the virus during birth, and remember, first of all, 15% of uh, mothers aren't screened uh, during pregnancy. Mm -hmm. um, another uh, 5% uh, will be have false negative results, which will be falsely reassuring. And you can acquire the virus in your second or third trimester. So that's what, hence the term jumping with a net for the title of this piece, because um, by, by vaccinating everyone, at birth or in the first couple of days of life, you then take away all those risks. The minute that you start to delay, you're taking a greater risk. So uh, when a baby is infected at or shortly after birth, after the incubation period, what, what kind of disease do you see? A hepatitis? You see, you see hepatitis. And then you see a 90% chance of developing cirrhosis or liver cancer. It is such a vulnerable period of time. Mm -hmm. And that's why it was so important to give that birth dose, which worked. I mean, we, we largely eliminated hepatitis B in children in this country because of that birth dose. 
And now you have somebody who's the head of the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices, which used to be called an independent group of experts, but can't be called that anymore because they don't have an expertise in the field. You have somebody who was now the head of that uh, working group uh, said, or the head of, sorry, the, the chairman of the ACIP said, you know, Denmark gives this vaccine at two months of age. So why don't we give it at two months of age? Well, the reason is twofold. First of all, Denmark screens roughly 100% of women in the first trimester. Uh, we don't. We do. It's around 85%. We're one of the worst developed world countries regarding that. And Denmark doesn't have the burden of hepatitis B that we have. So we're not Denmark. What, what do other countries do? Do we know? Yeah, many countries have a birth dose, but there are, are countries that delay it to one month of age or two months of age. Right. Remember, they, they, they have better screening than we have. They have national health care, which we don't have. And um, it's not the same. So when you when you have a baby who acquires hepatitis B virus and then develops hepatitis, do you treat the baby in some way? Well, there's not much to do, really. I mean, yeah. you, there are antivirals, but, you know, they, they have limited efficacy. So okay. um, the best way to avoid this is prevention, not treatment. And so when would... Uh, cirrhosis and, and hepatocellular carcinoma develop after many, many years, right? Many years or even decades, but you certainly do commit that child to a shortened life. So that child uh, becoming an adult, it could be a, a man or a woman and they could have kids and they could transmit hepatitis B virus to their kids. Yeah. Should they live that long? Yes. But uh, I, I, if you're, if you're, uh, between one and five years of age and you acquire hepatitis B, you have about a 25 to 30 percent chance of developing cirrhosis or liver cancer. If you're an adult that gets hepatitis B, you have a 5 percent or less chance of developing cirrhosis or liver cancer. So the childhood period is a vulnerable time. And I think people also don't realize how many people in this country have chronic hepatitis B, most of whom don't know it. They don't know they're chronically infected. And the virus can be uh, have as many as, you know, 100 million to even more infectious particles per ml of blood. And so you don't need to necessarily see a spot of blood on a towel or washcloth or toothbrush or, or shaving utensil or nail clipper. And, and that's how those children get it. Remember, 15, in 1991, 15,000 children, less than 10, got hepatitis B from relatively casual contact with someone who had had chronically infected and didn't know it. And so when people like Rand Paul or, or Donald Trump say, you know, you know, child's, how's a child going to get infected? They're, you know, the only people that get infected are people who are sex workers or people who are intravenous drug users. That's not true of those children, those 15,000 children, less than 10 every year in this country in the early 90s who got hepatitis B. Yeah. In fact, as you write in the column, Trump recently said hepatitis B virus is only sexually transmitted, but that's not right, is it? Hepatitis B is sexually transmitted. There's no reason to give a baby that's almost just born hepatitis B. That's not right. You can fairly say that for a human papillomavirus infection, um, which, which also actually can be acquired through the birth canal. But for the most part, that is a sexually transmitted mm -hmm. disease, which is why you can wait, frankly, till adolescence to vaccinate children against hepatitis, uh, human papillomavirus. But hepatitis B is a different entity, and it can be transmitted by relatively casual contact with someone who has chronic hepatitis B infection. Many of those people don't know they're infected. I think Globally, the burden is considerable. It's like 350 million known infected people, right? That's right. And, and it's because people don't know, uh, it's often called the silent epidemic. So I, I realize that the ACIP is selected to be anti-vaccine, so they'd like to get rid of as many vaccines as possible. But is there any reason to delay the vaccine. Are there any side effects when you give the vaccine shortly after birth that we have to worry about? The vaccine is as safe if you get it at birth as compared to if you get it at one or two months. It's as effective if you get it at birth as compared to if you get it at one or two months. There is no advantage to delaying. And so the reason the ACIP is considering this is because they say they're trying to maintain the public's trust in immunization and they know uh, actually, at some level, reasonably, that parents can re recoil at that birth dose. Here, your child's just been born, and now you're inoculating them with a biological agent that most people don't understand and, and against the virus that most people don't understand. And so it's easy to see how people can be uh, 
uh, can be confused about why their child, after having just been born, needs a vaccine. But again, I think our job then, if, if, if there has been any sort of loss of trust in that vaccine, is to explain why you're giving it, to have the kind of discussion we're having now, not to just say, okay, well, if you're nervous, then we'll delay it. Because that kind of brings us back to where we were in 2000 with thimerosal. The same argument was made then. You know, If we really want to maintain the public's trust, let's just move from multi-dose to single-dose vials. And so you no longer need this ethylmercury-containing preservative, which gave birth to anti-vaccine groups. And if anything, caused more of a loss of trust because we need to explain why we're doing what we're doing better, that it's a communications issue. Uh, if you want to maintain trust, I think you have, just have to communicate better. Isn't it also a problem when the president of the United States makes uh, statements that aren't based on facts? So he says hepatitis B is sexually transmitted. He said Tylenol causes autism. He said we don't want mercury or aluminum in vaccines. None of those are correct, are they? And when he also said we needed to, do, to separate the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine into right. its three component parts, that was like all in one statement. It was like one yes. thing was wrong after the next, after the next, after the next. And he has obviously a powerful platform as the president of the United States. And it is a um, very irresponsible, a dangerously irresponsible thing to say things that are just wrong. Hepatitis B is sexually transmitted. Tylenol during pregnancy can be associated with a very increased risk of autism. We want no mercury in the vaccine. We want no aluminum in the vaccine. The MMR, I think, should be taken separately. This is based on what I feel. And in a better world, his Secretary of Health and Human Services would immediately correct him, but we don't live in that world. <laughs> you know, the president has a bully pulpit, right? And so many people will listen to him just, just as if you go to the government's COVID site, it now says that the virus came from a lab. And so people are going to believe this when we know none of that uh, is true. But um, so do, what, when is the ACIP meeting again? Do you know offhand? They were supposed to meet the third week in October, uh, but it's just got delayed to December 4th and 5th. And that's when they'll, they'll bring this up. So do you, you feel that they're going to delay the, the HPV vaccine? I think they're going to delay the hepatitis B vaccine. Absolutely. I do. I think that's, that's uh, the only issue I think, and the reason they didn't vote on it uh, in September was uh, I think they were prepared to vote on it as a one month dose, or to, as a, either as a recommended or should be considered as a one month dose. I think they're even looking to delay it more than that. I had heard 12 months. Is that some, is that correct? Or am I thinking? Well, actually, uh, President Trump said 12 years. He said that we should delay it until 12 years of age. I would say wait till the baby is 12 years old and formed and take hepatitis B. Which makes even less sense. Uh, why don't we wait till they're, they're sort of the least vulnerable until we vaccinate? Them? Because you're, you're most vulnerable as an infant or as a child, which is why you need that vaccine early. So yeah, yeah I, I, we'll see. I, 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 if they delay it till 12 months, then, then what they're doing is they're taking these children who could be born to a mother who's infected and, and, and either from a false screening test or a later infection, didn't know it, and then taking the most vulnerable period. 90% of infants who, who acquire this virus will go on to develop cirrhosis or liver cancer. It is a very, very vulnerable period of time. We need to protect these children. So let's say they, the ACIP decides to delay the vaccine to one or two months. What will be the, the consequence on uh, hepatitis B levels? What they tend to do is not make a recommendation. I mean, you saw, I don't know if you saw in the last 24 hours, the, uh, the uh, Jim O'Neill, the acting CDC director, um, said that, you know, that they've just agreed with what the ACIP said regarding COVID vaccines. So COVID vaccines can be given according to individual decision making. Mm -hmm. So they've sort of removed the CDC as a recommending body. I think that would happen here, too. I think they would say that, you know, you can consider getting it at birth, or you can consider getting it later without having a recommendation. So they'll take away the birth dose recommendation. And that's Project 2025, which is to eliminate CDC as a recommending body. So uh, the, the I guess it's the obstetrician who gives the vaccine shortly after birth, right? Or the pediatricians. Or the pediatrician comes in. So it's really up to the doctors now to do the right thing. And they will. 
I really do think they will. I mean, I'm really encouraged by what's happened at the state level, mm-hmm. including our state or our Commonwealth, uh, Pennsylvania. <laughs> uh, Governor Shapiro just stood up and said, you know, we are going to find a good medical practice and we're going to make sure that those good medical practices are going to, are paid for. In other words, we will be our own vaccine for children's program. Mm-hmm. And you saw just on TV today, they put up a sign for the Western Alliance. Western state alliance for who should get a COVID vaccine, who should get a flu vaccine, and make sure they get paid for it. So there are many groups that are standing up. Unfortunately, not everybody is standing up. I just had to speak uh, in Montana this week, and they, what they were saying is, you know, we can get a COVID vaccine for people whose insurance pays for it, but we can't get it through the Vaccine for Children's program, which means that children who are either uninsured or underinsured aren't going to be able to get this COVID vaccine, at least as of a few days ago. And uh, we've set up a two-tiered system for the rich and poor. So the I I also assume the medical societies are also going to do the right thing as well in terms of recommendation, right? Definitely. American Academy of Pediatrics, Infectious Disease Society of America, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology are all standing up. So that's good. The problem is things are a little fragmented and some states are better going to be better prepared and others aren't. So should the ACIP says we're not going to recommend uh, hep B vaccine at birth? still physicians should be aware that they should do that and hopefully it won't change the practice very much, correct? I hope not. And I hope the American Academy of Pediatrics, again, stands up as they did for the COVID vaccine for for young children and say, look, this is the recommendation. This is best medical practice. So the the last thing I want to know is how does this, and you just touched on it a little, but how does it impact insurance paying for a vaccine? So let's say if if there's no official CDC recommendation for hep B right after birth, yet medical societies and these West and East Coast health alliances recommend it. How will that affect uh, insurance payments? I've been um, pretty impressed by insurance companies' willingness to follow good medical practice, which is also good business, frankly. It's much cheaper to pay for a vaccine than a hospitalization, much cheaper to pay for a vaccine than to pay for treating somebody with cirrhosis or liver cancer. Okay. You can uh, read the original column at Beyond the Noise. We'll put a link in the show notes. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent.